Here's where we're, where we're at today. Okay, so I understand the significance of what I'm holding in my hand. How do I approach it? I trust in God. He deserves my service. I lean on Him. I want to do what's pleasing. So now how, what do I do? And this is one attempt <laughs> at trying to explain this. And, and what I thought, I, I've actually spent a lot of time and, um, and thought about this, and I'm just going to walk this through with you. Genesis chapter 2, let's do that. Genesis chapter 2. I want you to imagine for a moment that you're new to all of this Bible thing, and you open up the pages, and you start reading about God's creation. Okay? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And okay, He creates everything in six days. He's going to rest on the seventh. You're going to... Learn about how he creates man. He makes, makes him from dust, and he takes woman out of him. And, and you're going to read this man is called Adam. He lives 930 years, so we're actually told how long the guy lives. Okay? You're going to continue through the Bible as you continue to read, and you're going to find out that this man has a wife, Eve. They have children, like one of their kids killed another one. They've got a whole lineage, a whole family line. And as you continue on, through Adam's line comes eventually, now I'm in the New Testament, comes who? Jesus. Okay, so, so you're reading a historical event. Do you follow me? You're reading about this man, Adam. And let's look, for example, at a few, just a few observations so here's God has created everything. I'm in chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Okay, you're reading that. You continue on. Okay, so God rested. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, you probably wouldn't read that and be like, I guess I'm not supposed to work on that day. You're, you're just reading about it. Okay, that's, that's what happens. You're not going to read anything about this actually for a good while. As you continue through your Bible, eventually you're going to come to Exodus chapter 20. And this is in context. Now, Moses has received the law on Mount Sinai, if you remember that. And the fourth of the Ten Commandments, as we, we, we call them, right? These commandments written on stone. The fourth is, remember the Sabbath day and keep it Okay, and so they were to do no work on the Sabbath. So now you're learning that there's a specific people that came from Abraham. We're calling them the, the Hebrew people, the Israelites, and they are given a specific law. They're supposed to rest and do no work. All right, easy enough. You're going to continue on, and obviously this group of people, the Israelites, end up being a very important people in the biblical narrative. Just a couple examples, just a couple examples to get the job done. Look at uh, Romans chapter 3, for example, how Paul talks about the Israelite nation. I'm in Romans chapter 3, verse 1. Then what advantage has the Jews, or what did is the value of circumcision much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. Specifically, that group of people. And, and just so you're not going crazy, look at chapter 9. He doubles down on this commentary of the Jews. Now, right now, he's talking about how that he wished he could be accursed on behalf of his brethren. Verse 3 of chapter 9. Uh, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Look at this, verse 4. They are Israelites. He's naming them specifically. And to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law. So the Ten Commandments. The worship and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs. And from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. From that people, specifically through that lineage comes Jesus. And this is a, a special people given special promises and law and covenants and all the good stuff. Now, they bring forth Jesus. Let's talk about Jesus for a moment. Look at Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. 
Where is he going with all this? Just hang in there. We're just studying. We're just talking Bible. This is, <laughs> we're going through a process right now. Okay, I'm in Galatians chapter 4, 4 and 5. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Jesus Christ was born into what family? The Israelite family. Jesus Christ was under what? The law. What law? The Mosaic law. He came, it says, to redeem those who were under the law. So he came to redeem his people. Okay? These passages you're familiar with. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus was not against the old law. Jesus actually had to keep the old law. Jesus states in his Sermon on the Mount, in verse chapter 5, verse 17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, which is interesting language considering what we're going to read here in just a little bit. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Do we see that? I didn't come to abolish it. I came to fulfill it. And nothing's going to pass away from this law until I what? Yeah. So he's going to fulfill this. Now, listen to this, Ephesians chapter 2. So he's going to fulfill it, and he's going to redeem his people. No problem there. Now we read Ephesians chapter 2, 11 through 16. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at the time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments... Now that's interesting. Have you ever thought about that? I did not come to abolish the law. Who, is, <laughs> who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross or by killing hostility. You're also going to learn, okay, <laughs> so he can't fulfill the law, but he does end up abolishing the law. And now he doesn't just come to save the Israelites, he comes to save who? Everyone. That was the mystery that, that Paul would keep writing about, the mystery that is now revealed. The mystery is this, everyone of faith is included, right? Hebrews chapter 8, look at this. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Verse 1. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We've had such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. That's Jesus. A minister in the holy places, in the true tent. He's not talking about the tabernacle. He's talking about heaven. Okay? That the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Priests offer gifts, sacrifices? Well, then so will Jesus the high priest. Now if, now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. And Jesus wouldn't have done that because he was from the tribe of Judah and not Levi. Okay, they, and the, he's already gotten in all of that. They serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, the tabernacle, he was instructed by God saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than that of the Old Covenant. He, uh, as the Old Covenant, he, he, uh, 
uh, mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. Look at verse 13. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish. Uh, vanish. Now, I think it's just saying it's getting ready to. There were still Jews that were still trying to keep to it. Now, that was about to go away. There was not even ability to do that once Jerusalem was punished. But the reality is, is that Christ made it obsolete. Whenever you look at uh, chapter 10 of the same letter, verses 8 through 10, when he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Sean, why are you going through this? Okay, so th this is Bible study. There's nothing about this that, that's, that's odd or unique. So, like you read about the seventh day. When you first read about it, okay, nothing stands out. You read about it underneath the Mosaic people, okay? Uh, the, the Israelites, that is, excuse me. They were giving a specific command on the Sabbath not to work. You're going to find out in passages like Exodus 31 Things like circumcision, things like the Sabbath, were actually unique to that people because they separated them from the Gentiles. Jesus Christ came in, born in that lineage, under the law, and fulfilled the whole law. But after he fulfilled it, he did what? He abolished it. So guess what? There's a reason why yesterday it wouldn't be sinful to what? Because you're not a who. Under the what? Because it's gone. All right. So that's just, that's just Bible study, brethren. That's not, a u that's not a unique position. There's not like a denomination out there or an interdenomination or non-denomination that says, we got a way to approach the Bible, and it's crazy, something like you never heard of before. No, that's just like how we do things. You just think things through. Let me give you another example. We'll go back to Genesis chapter 2. And I wanted to use this because typically when we're getting, I, I was, I'm not trying to be different, but many times when we're talking about the topic of authority, we're going to go to Genesis 6 and the flood. We're going to go to Nadab and Abihu. We're going to go to all these, we go to all these examples, and my fear is that we're not learning how to think for ourselves. What I'm trying to show you is just give me a chapter in the Bible and look how this goes. That's what I'm hoping that we're going to see this morning with the few minutes that we have left. Here's something else. Um, food, right? I know this may sound... Let's just look at food. Uh, you're going to come to Genesis chapter 2, 8 and 9. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put uh, the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the eye and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, fair enough. Look at verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. That's good to know. <laughs> Okay, we're learning about what happened with him. Now, I have to ask you a question. Is this applicable to you? Okay, I'm not even going to let you answer that one. Now, if we were to read, look at this, in chapter 1, verse 29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. Now, so you begin to put them all together, and you get a more accurate picture. It's not just everything. And now you talk about two specific trees, and now you talk about one that you can't eat of. Fair enough? So there you go. Um, what's also interesting, now listen to how I word this. If I'm looking at this as a Bible student, later on I'll continue through my studies after the flood, Genesis chapter 9. Uh, verse 1, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. 
Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. As I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood, I will require, require a reckoning. Okay, let me just stop right there. So I read that and, and I go, you know, one conclusion could be that he's just reiterating something that he, that he already knew. But another co- conclusion could be that he's introducing something new. And that would be that before, maybe they weren't eating animals. And maybe he's saying, well, you can eat animals now. Like, remember how I gave you the fruit and all the veggies? Well, now you can eat these animals, okay? But I don't want you drinking. I don't want you eating its blood because life is in the blood. So I got something significant about this. Okay, interesting. Now, as you continue on, whenever you come into that Israelite nation, you're going to see this in like Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14. The Bible will talk about fish and birds and animals, but it puts them into two categories. You remember what they are? Clean and unclean. So now they know, hey, there are some animals I can eat and there are some animals I can't eat. Now I can own all of them, but I can't eat all of them or I can't sacrifice all of them, right? So that was underneath the Mosaic law, which is why whenever you come to Acts chapter 10, now we're going to, the, to, the, to, um, to Peter, who was under the new covenant, but grew up a Jew, And still was learning things. In Acts chapter 10, he sees this vision. Now notice what happens here. Acts chapter 10, verse 9. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. Okay, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. And saw the heavens open, and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. So when it talks about there being all kinds of animals, what that's showing you is that apparently he's seeing clean and unclean animals, or else why would he say, No, I've never eaten anything that's unclean. And the voice came to him again and said a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. Now, there's a couple things going on here with the larger text here. You got Cornelius, it's about to, a Gentile is going to come to the Lord. But there's a lot of, there's, there's more significance behind this. It's a new era, it's a new covenant. There's lots of, there are changes going on. Here's what's interesting in Mark chapter 7. Jesus was, there was criticism. Why aren't your disciples eating with, with, with uh, washed hands? They're eating with defiled hands. Now, this was a custom, a tradition that they had. I'm in Mark chapter 7. Mark 7. Jesus ends up teaching them. Um, Let's just start in verse 14. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable, and he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Then the author says, Thus he declared all foods clean. So it was in his teaching there, but they're not not yet quite grasping it. It's not come to fruition. Which is now why in Romans 14, are you having fun? You all look so happy this morning. I'm happy too. Romans 14. This is why in Romans 14, verse 1, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the, the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on a servant of another? God's welcomed him. You know what you find out as you connect all these dots? 
So there, there's a problem whenever someone comes up to a Christian and then they say, oh, if you follow the Bible, why, don't you, why do you eat shellfish? <laughs> well, because I'm not a Jew under the old law. See that? Or, or it's a problem, too, if a Christian decides that they're getting real, you know, what's, a, what's a, like super crunchy? Is that the t- term? Am I even using this right? And they're like, let's, let's just go back to Genesis chapter 1. Okay, that's fine if you want to, but like, no, I don't have to. <laughs> what you also find out is that from a biblical standpoint, you learn how to navigate some things. There are some things in God's Word where we know, not you think, you can confirm this thing is okay to do it or not to do it from God's point of view. And He leaves that to our own doing. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's why I love bacon and I eat it. Now I could go on to other discussions. I could have someone that is from a different religion or region that that would be offensive to them and I wouldn't eat bacon in front of them and that's a different that's that would just further study because I'm just collecting all the passages right let's do one more marriage one more marriage okay so here we are back in Genesis chapter 2 uh, it, let's start with verse 18 through 23 Genesis chapter 2 18 through 23 Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds, to the heavens, to to the beasts of the field. Uh, But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord caused... Uh, God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one, one of his ribs, closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now this is Moses' commentary on this, okay? Therefore... A man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. We, we learn about the nature of this relationship. Look at verse uh, 27 of chapter 1. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the, the fish. And so on and so forth. Okay, so here they are. He's made Adam. He's made Eve. They are together. Man leaves his father and mother, clings to his wife. They're to multiply. But here's another thing. They have roles. So you remember how Eve is tempted. And then Adam follows. Notice what God says whenever he curses them. So I'm in Genesis chapter 3. Here's what he says to the woman, verse 16. I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing, and pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. You were taken out of Adam to be his help meet, and you took the reins. Guess what? You don't hold the reins. Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Adam shouldn't have been listening to your wife. And you're going to be cursed. So here's another thing that's fun. You're going to see as we start going through the Bible that men, again and again, are taking a position of leadership. Jesus comes in the form of a man. Jesus chooses 12. Okay. Uh, Ephesians 5. The man is... Okay. 1 Timothy 2. So next week we're going to get in. This is why I wanted to do this before we hit roles of women. We're going to do that. But I thought, let's, let's, let's talk about the concept of authority. So we're going to talk about that next week. But essentially, anytime we're getting into topics, brethren, we're essentially doing what I'm doing today. <laughs> we're going through the Bible and harmonizing it. Now, let's get back to this idea of marriage. So you've got 
Man and woman come together. Man leaves father and mother, clings to his wife. Jesus is being challenged in Matthew chapter 19. They're trying to, to trap him. And they're talking about divorce. And I think something is really interesting what Jesus does with this passage. Jesus takes them back to Genesis 2. reminds them. They ask, is it lawful to divorce your wife for any cause? He takes them back to the garden scene. He quotes, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's, that's what Moses is saying. Jesus says, So, they are no longer two flesh, but one flesh. What, therefore, God has joined together, let not man separate. So then Jesus comes to the conclusion, well, if they come together and they cling, guess what? You don't need to be pulling them apart. You don't need to be separating that. That was his conclusion to the matter. Now what Jesus, having authority, does is he goes on to give an exception. You remember that? If you're divorcing your spouse and marrying another, it's adultery. That is unless it's for sexual morality. Then as you continue on, you're going to read that Paul reiterates the same teaching as Jesus, although it's interesting, Paul never brings up the exception. Did you know that? Paul never mentions the exception in any of his writings. So we're putting it all together, and we learn a little bit something about marriage and how it goes in their roles, and there you are. Now, I specifically try not to use any of these terms. We have used hermeneutics. I don't know what you're talking about. So, like, when we started off talking about Adam being a man who was 930 years old, had a wife, had kids in the lineage, in other words, we're looking at how we interpret Scripture, and we're looking at Genesis 2 and saying there's no valid reason to look at this as allegory. You're like, whatever, dude. You're like... We're on the same page, right? Yes. You, whether you know what allegory is or know to have a discussion about hermeneutics, you probably did that anyways. Okay? Deductive reasoning. So we started with specific passages to come to a general conclusion. Did you see that? We do that all the time. Now, here's the thing about deductive reasoning. If, you, if you're not looking at all the passages and all the information, you can come up with an erroneous view. So deductive reasoning means that you need to harmonize everything. <laughs> you got to get all the passages together, anything that relates to that topic. So like, for example, did you notice how whenever we were talking about the Sabbath day and I started going into Jesus being born under the old law and fulfilling the old law and then accomplish uh, and then um, it becoming obsolete? None of those had the word seventh day or Sabbath in them. But it, 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 it's important to the discussion. So now once you get in all the information, you're harmonizing them. Patterns, like when I talked about, I wasn't trying to, trying to get anyone riled up, but when I'm talking about men and their leadership role, you see patterns, for example, throughout the Bible. When you look into baptism, you're going to see a pattern of baptism. General and specific. Generally speaking, eat any, eat any um, fruit or vegetable. Well, but there are two specific trees. Oh, and there's one tree in particular. Don't eat of that one. So when we're talking about general and specific authority, brother, I mean, you're just, you're just doing it naturally. You see what I mean? Uh, command. So here's the thing. Here are what gets... So <laughs> command, example, necessary inference are the terms that, we, that, that are very common. They are not within themselves authority. They can point to what may be authoritative, okay? But not all commands you are supposed to follow. For example, do not eat anymore of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, it's a command, but that just simply doesn't apply to you. Why? You know why. Or sometimes there's a context that needs to be understood. Jesus washes the disciples' feet, commands them to do the same. What is he talking about? Okay? But here's the other thing. Sometimes there are also commands that are not given, but we still come to conclusions. Do you know I cannot show you a passage in the New Testament that condemns cocaine? 
So have at it then, buddy. Well, I, I'm going to really encourage you not to snort cocaine, and for a lot of good reasons. And, and Paul encourages this mindset, and it's there. He'll talk about the works of the flesh in, in Galatians chapter 5, 19 through 21. He'll give some examples of evil practices, and he says, and things, and things like these. Romans chapter 1, when he's talking about humankind, he says that they're just inventor of evil. You just invent stuff. So even though we may not have a command, it doesn't mean that we still can't make decisions all the time. Same things with examples. Listen, not every example is meant to be followed. In Acts chapter 6, they had these widows that were being neglected, and they chose how many men? Seven men. Well, then I guess if we're going to choose deacons, we can only choose seven men. Okay, so here's the other thing, and, and we, we're afraid to use this term, but I'm going to use it. You have to use some common sense. We like to formulize everything, though sometimes to a degree, that we're not, you, we're not allowing any common sense, brethren. I've used the illustration that if I were to, my kids right now are really wanting to learn drums, okay? And so I'm sitting down and I'm showing them some, some, some drum beats. Now, if I started seeing a pattern that every single time Jace sat down to play the drums that he was wearing black shorts, and I said, Jace, why do you keep changing into your black shorts? And he's like, well, when you showed me how to play the drums, you were wearing black shorts. I would go, oh. <laughs> oh. Okay, we're holding him back a year, okay? So, so you're, you're going you're gonna to use some common sense, brethren, and it's okay to say that. But examples are great. And the idea of patterns are totally biblical. And so we're looking at examples and trying to navigate Hey, what do we follow? And can I tell you something? It's hard sometimes. So for those that, that, are, that are in the faith, that have been around, let me tell you, it's hard. I think sometimes I've gotten some right and sometimes I've gotten some wrong. We may get, we may get some things wrong, but we continue to try to seek, okay? We keep trying. Necessary inference. This is the one we don't like. And the reason why we don't like necessary inference is because we come to conclusions that are not necessary inferences. And we put it in the category of a necessary inference. So, for example, whenever I took you to Genesis 9, and I said, listen to how I word it. I said, it could be that God is just reiterating something. Maybe, maybe their family was already eating animals, but God is just reiterating something that wasn't recorded for us. Or maybe it was something new. Do you see what I mean? I can't prove it one way or the other. Although you're like, yeah, but I like to think it sounds like it's new. I agree with you, but I, can't, I don't know that. I don't know that. Whereas, if you got something like in Acts chapter 8, look at this passage. So, Philip meets eunuch, the eunuch on the chariot, if you remember that one. And um, he's reading from Isaiah 53. Do you understand what you're reading? How can I unless someone guides me? And so, um, Acts chapter 8, look at verse uh, 35. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. So he starts with Isaiah 53 and then talks, teaches him about Jesus. The next verse, and as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here's water, what prevents me from being baptized? There is no reasonable conclusion to say that whenever he preached Jesus to him, he didn't talk about baptism. That is actually a necessary inference. He started with Isaiah 53, preached Christ unto him, and the next thing the guy is doing is like, well, there's water. I guess I should be baptized. Do you see that? Whenever Jesus was baptized, he went into the water. He came, remember the Spirit? He came out of the water. Do you think Jesus was sprinkled? Philip went, and the eunuch went into the water, the text says, and they came 
the necessary inferences that they went into something and came out. There, there's no escaping that. Or whenever now we're thinking about something, well, who is baptism for? Well, I, I'll tell you this. It's for those who can hear, who can understand, who can believe, who can repent. So if you can't do that, I guess it's not... Brethren, we, we, we use this conclusion all the time. You know, I cannot, I cannot take you to a passage that deals with people who are mentally handicapped. Are you worried that those who are mentally handicapped are going to hell? Why? You know, the, what's crazy is that no, everyone in the, in the whole Christian realm, no matter what views you hold, no one touches that with the ten-foot pole. Why? Because there's a necessary inference there. They understand how could a person be accountable whenever they can't even understand. But I can't give you a book, chapter, and verse for that. So the thing is, it's not bad, but it needs to be respected. And so there it is. I'm just hoping to show you that there is no perfect formula for this. This isn't something that one group of people came up with, okay? And now they're trying to make it their unique approach to the Bible. All of these things in and of themselves can have weaknesses. And so whenever people ask me, whenever I'm seeking, I'm, I'm seeking to do the Lord's will, Sean, what do you encourage? My, my short answer is this. You need context and you need harmony. Know what it is whatever it is you're looking at, and then harmonize all the passages together, and then go. Okay, I'm done for this morning. I appreciate your patience. I hope this has been helpful to you. And I want to end with one passage. Uh, this was actually in my, uh, my personal Bible study this week, and I thought, oh, this is, there's no, this is a great passage to end with. Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 1, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all of God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if, there's the if, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. We ask you to come forward right now if you need to, as together we stand and we sing.